What does it mean to be truly sovereign? Well, in the Webster's Dictionary, there are two definitions for the word sovereign. The first is a noun, and it means one possessing the supreme power and authority in a state. It's also a gold coin of the UK. The second definition in Webster's Dictionary of sovereign is an adjective, and it means excellent or fine, supreme in power or authority, having undisputed ascendancy, chief, or having independent authority. Synonyms for sovereign are autonomous, free, independent, self-governing, separate. So, funny thing about words. You see, words can change their meanings over time, apparently. So, I'll start by saying that I use the term sovereignty as it's generally understood, both in terms of national sovereignty and individual sovereignty. In essence, it means self-determination or self-government. When a nation talks about sovereignty, it means its right to determine what goes on inside of its borders. Its right to exist as a self-determining, self-governing geographic area. When an individual talks about sovereignty, he or she means his or her right to determine what goes on in his or her own life. So, in order to understand what is meant by sovereignty, Let's go back a little and see how it arises. In the world as it now stands, all land in the sovereign territory of one nation or another, except the Arctic regions which are controlled by international treaty. The oceans of the world, apart from territorial waters, are also covered by various treaties. If you wanted to have your own sovereign piece of real estate, you're out of luck. People may have thought it would be great if we could just buy an island or run it according to our own ideas. This thinking misunderstands sovereignty. Sure, you might purchase an island. There are many around the world for sale. However, when you part with the cash, you're not buying sovereignty. That still resides in the country whose jurisdiction extends over the island. You'd soon find out who was sovereign if you tried to eliminate income tax on your newly acquired island. If you really wanted to claim your own sovereign territory, you'd need to keep a watchful eye out for the emergence of a complete new land, say an undersea volcano erupting into a new landmass. Now, such a new landmass, provided it was outside existing territorial waters, would indeed be unclaimed land. And this is where we get to the nub of what sovereignty really is. Suppose such a new island appears in the middle of an ocean somewhere and you rush by helicopter and land on it. All you would need to do is put up your flag and you would have claimed sovereignty over it. Unfortunately, you may not be alone. While you're rushing all by yourself to your newly discovered island, it is highly likely that some nearby nation is likewise sending a landing party, claiming some special case as to why it should be theirs. And when push comes to shove, they may decide to remove you by force of arms and the ensuing potential conflict of interest that actually encapsulates the entire history of the world, the battle for territory. So, you can certainly claim sovereignty over a new piece of land, but you'll also need to be able to defend this newfound sovereignty. And in these enlightened times, one may expect that might is not always right, and that some international court may arbitrate this issue. It still doesn't change the basic fact that sovereignty must first be claimed, then defended. If sovereignty didn't need defending, then no country would be in need of, say, armed forces. Sovereignty is therefore at the mercy of any party that chooses to dispute it. Tax havens, for example, exist for this very reason, as a means of defense. It's a way of protecting sovereignty. It's not enough to simply stand up and declare it, because those who oppose you may not play the game by your rules 
and to use force to deprive you of it. You're not granted sovereignty by virtue of being born in any particular country. You are sovereign because of your status as a flesh and blood living soul and a breathing human. The breath of life derives from the laws of the universe, such as cause and effect. You're already sovereign, but a prisoner of a larger, more powerful influence. Cultivated ignorance. Such a mistake could cost you dearly. Even though you may perceive that some statute law may save you, you mustn't ignore the fact that the state can simply rewrite its statutory laws and constitutions to better suit its circumstances. It has the power to do this. No, your sovereignty doesn't depend on the state. Your sovereignty was in place, or antecedent, long before the formation of the state. You have it in the state's absence. Your task is to learn how to defend it cleverly. Of course, in the present world, there is no free nation, no place where it is easy to fully assert your sovereignty. Governments want you to have a good job, in the same way that a burglar wants you to have a house full of valuables, a nice, fat cash flow. However, by learning how to better protect your assets, not based on the laws of your nation state, but based on your capacity to outwit it and outmaneuver it. One option is to play off one nation state against another by using various international strategies, such as offshore asset protection, and thereby use the laws of one country to play off against the laws of another. As awareness of true human sovereignty spreads and disillusionment with the nation state grows, there will arise more and more means of increasing one's practical freedom. And how do we measure true value anyway? This kind of reminds me of a story. There was a, product, a practitioner who had an exceptional gift for fixing health problems. And after serving the people for over 30 years, she happily retired. Several years later, an ex-patient who was experiencing health problems contacted the practitioner asking for help because her current doctors and other health professionals were unable to provide a suitable remedy. The practitioner reluctantly took up the challenge. She spent a very short time with the patient and arrived at a diagnosis. Ah, she said, here's the problem. And with an ink marker drew a cross on Mary's chest, which took five seconds and then gave her a healing potion. Within days, Mary's health had been fully restored. The practitioner duly sent an account check for $2,000. After a month or so, a letter arrived from Mary's accountant querying what appeared to be an excessive bill. The practitioner responded, One ink mark, one dollar. Knowing where to put the ink mark, $1,999. And so I believe the moral of this particular story would be, if you think the cost of education is too high, then consider the cost of ignorance. <laughs>